once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Our guest author is Ellen Marie Edmonds, author of Embracing Dementia, A Call to Love. Welcome, Ellen, back to EWTN's Bookmark. Thank you, Doug. Good to be here. Uh, people hear you uh, sometimes on the radio. Certainly you've been a guest on uh, Women of Grace. Yes. Uh, at, and really talking about Embracing Dementia, A Call to Love. Now, that's your book. And the book goes back to what, 08, is it about? That's when it was published, came out in early 09. Okay, so about five years now or so, four or five years we're talking about. Uh, now, it's not that you have a new book, we wanted to talk about this in general, but really what's new is that uh, that you actually have it now on audio? Yes. Okay, so that's yes. so the latest thing. So you, you have the book, then you put out a kind of a large print edition, right? Yes. Okay. And now you have the audio book. Right. Okay. Trying to meet people wherever their needs so are. So when you first put the book out, you had the reaction, and then people said, I like it, but a lot of older people need would rather have a big print edition? Yes. Well, actually, the large print and the regular print came out at the, at same, the same time, time. by request. Okay. But then later... So you knew that ahead of time? I knew that ahead of time. Uh, the audio, the request for audio came out later, mm -hmm. um, primarily in response to a priest who cannot read. He, he's uh, blind with macular okay. degeneration. Okay. Does a lot of counseling and I thought that it would be helpful for him. Wow. But then, you know, from uh, just a, the perspective of folks today really enjoy mm -hmm. audio books. Right, exactly. Um, you can listen in your car, yes. or you can listen at home, or you can load it on your computer and then uh, download it onto your MP3 player or yes. whatever. Now, actually, this is how many discs? Are these, how many discs are there actually? There in this are bank? five discs. Five discs. It's and this is the entire book read by you? Yes. No. None of it's abridged. Not abridged or anything. Okay. Right. Now, inside here, there's something else, uh, and this is a, a picture of who this book really is all about, right? That's right. Your your, your late husband, husband Frank, right? And and what exactly actually in on these it look like poems? What exactly did you put in here? Well, it was interesting, Doug. Um, this whole journey, the last year was particularly difficult, and I did a lot of journaling. Mm -hmm. And a year or so after, I went back looking through the journal to try to figure out what had happened. What what had I just gone through? What did I need to do? What's next? And I shared it with my spiritual director and realized that that this came out in the form of poetry, sort of groanings of the heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, my spiritual director, who was Father Angelus, had asked me mm -hmm. in the book to be sure to put those writings at the beginning of each chapter. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, they're, they're poems, they're very deep encounters with our Lord. Um, it's evidence of how He manifests Himself to us when we are struggling, mm -hmm. uh, when we're going through suffering. And so I think that was the reason that my spiritual director uh, asked me to do that, to help people who maybe feel those same um, sense of the sense of, of sorrow or mm -hmm. fear or anger or even joy. And to be able to see that expressed through my writings. Right. And these are actually poems that you've written. Yes. Right? They're all my own writings. Okay. And there's an index. Had you ever done that before? No, I had not. Okay, so this is really something that came out of your experience of caring for your husband. It did, and I, I think, you know, I've never been particularly drawn to poetry. Mm -hmm. I've never considered myself a poet, but what I saw and what I learned is that these groanings of the heart, uh, I think that's what poetry is, groanings of the heart during particular times that, um, that we're unable to think the way we normally do, but where the heart really is taking over. And so it's very powerful and I get a lot of good right. feedback on that. So I think it's helpful. So how long has the audio actually been out now? Uh, it came out last year. Okay. And so it's been a good response to it. A lot of people, okay. uh, when they have the option for the audio, uh, we'll take that. Some people get both because okay. some people like to highlight. Mm -hmm. Other people uh, enjoy reading the book, but they also enjoy hearing me read my own poems. Right. No. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's true. Right. And I would think uh, also uh, all of us learn in different ways. Some people are visual learners, others yes. are good auditory that's learners. True. A couple of things I noticed on here uh, uh, talking about this is that I see you have Bishop Baker, our local ordinary here, of course, who yes. says, may your book help many families who are struggling caring for loved ones with dementia diseases. I also noticed this. Uh, that uh, someone related to the Alzheimer's Association talks about purchasing a book for our library. What has been the response from, let's say, uh, the secular community you know, well, related actually, to dementia? Well, it's, actually, it's very interesting, Doug, that you know this disease really crosses all socioeconomic boundaries. And um, the secular world has just as much of a need for help 
and for hope in this, this journey of dementia disease, which can be very, very uh, dark, mm -hmm. very frightening, um, and, and you feel a sense of despair and help, helplessness. And so um, there has been a tremendous response. I have been asked to speak for Alzheimer's Association conferences. Mm -hmm. um, I've spoken at many different types of conferences. So, uh, and the feedback has been very, very good. Mm -hmm. And I think that in some ways, it's a helpful tool for those who maybe are particularly fertile because mm -hmm. of the, the journey itself. And it helps them to begin to see our Lord in a new way at a time when they really need that and they're more open to it. So um, I don't know what the statistics mm -hmm. are uh, as far as r the conversions that might be affected mm -hmm. from it, but I do get an awful lot of calls mm -hmm. from even people of Jewish faith, mm -hmm. uh, people of the Protestant faith, uh, it's just been good because the disease mm -hmm. goes to those places. And this is something that makes common ground for all of us. When you get into a situation where you're unable to fix the problem and it impacts your life mm -hmm. and your relationships and every area of life so much, you're, you're just looking for help mm -hmm. and you need that hope. And for people that are, um, that are secular, maybe agnostic, or even have been away from the, the faith for a long time, um, there, there, there has to be a sense of hope to be able to right. embrace this journey, and I think that's what the book does. Right, a call to love, finding hope, loving someone with Alzheimer's or other dementias is, is like the subtitle here. Yes. Um, now let me ask you too, uh, in the sense of who this is written for, obviously this comes out of your own experience. So the kind of person who, who, who wants a book like this or feels the need to have a book like this, are these people who are starting, who are caregivers? Are people who have seen dementia in their family? Are they people who've seen it maybe and are trying to make sense with why does this happen? How does this happen? How does one make sense of watching, as described in some cases, a person like disappear in front of you? Well, all of those examples are exactly who this book is for mm -hmm. um, because it does take you through the journey that I went through personally. And my husband was a CEO. He was a big man, intelligent, very successful in contributing, who went all the way backwards through the stages of life to mm -hmm. infancy. Mm -hmm. And so what I do in this book is take people through that journey step by step, being able to see uh, the signs of change, um, being able to recognize that there was a new reality in him, in our relationship, being able to show people the choices that I had to make, mm -hmm. the um, experiences, the what lessons What would be the kind of tough choices that you had to make that, that other people are going to have to realize they're going to have to make as well, probably? I think part of it is recognizing, first of all, that this person that has been in a very important relationship to you, um, is going to lose so much of their personality and who they've been to you, mm -hmm. whether it's your mother or father, whether it's a grandparent, whether it's your spouse, as mine was, or even a very close friend, how you have known this person and how you have engaged the relationship mm -hmm. is changing. And so often there is a, a role reversal involved. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's difficult. My husband was my protector. He uh, took care of all the finances. And little by little, I was discovering often, you know, in an emergency situation that I had to take over something new and then something new and something new. And what the book helps people to see is how that can happen and let you know ahead of time that there can be these kinds of changes coming on the horizon. And it gives you an opportunity mm -hmm. to sort of role play and prepare. And then for those, Doug, that are not even dealing with the disease today, you know, the statistics tell us that just in this country, 7 million people have dementia disease, 30 million around the world. But for everyone that is diagnosed, there are an average of nine more people like me affected. And just in the U.S., that means 70 million mm -hmm. people that either have it or are dealing with it. So the odds are that all of our viewers mm -hmm. know someone that either has it in their family, maybe they have it in the family themselves, or maybe there's a fear that because the parent had it. Right. I was going to ask you, in your case, obviously because there's not a blood relationship because right. it was your husband, and, and and also because it was kind of brought on by an accident, right? Right, it was a head drama. Right, uh, as opposed to a mother-daughter type situ situation where you might have the mom has Alzheimer's and right. the daughter who's not only taking care of her and watching all of this go on, but 
maybe in the back of their mind is saying, am I looking at my future? And in that case, Doug, you have sort of the sandwich situation. Right. You know, you've got the daughter that's trying to deal with her own family, but there is still this tremendous sense of loss of losing your mother. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the mom that has been such a treasured mm -hmm. part of my life. And it's very difficult to come to a place of being able to tell your mother no when you need to say no, or to tell her something she has to do when you've, there's that respect part of the relationship, but the time comes that you have to realize that, you know, this person in the relationship that's been historical now has become the little one and you have right. to become the big one. That can be difficult. And, and just like it's tough as a parent, especially in the world we live today, to in a sense tell people things they don't want to hear, right. especially when you're dealing with a person uh, who's going through this. I've had some experience uh, with my own mother-in-law who doesn't see themselves that way. They, right. they start to lose and many times touch with, in this particular case, with reality and where they are and what's going on. And so as you try to help them or correct them, they view it totally like, what are you saying? What are you talking about? Uh, you know, and there's, and in this case, you know, can even be a little bit of paranoia about what's oh, going sure. on, you know. And it's hard for the person who has the disease too, because they are losing a part of self. Mm -hmm. There's a fear connected with that. There's a real grief mm -hmm. that they go through. Everyone that is in a relationship with them has fear and grief, and it's different for everyone. But you know, I think what's very helpful is to realize that this disease is really a physical disease of the brain. Mm -hmm. And if you think of the brain like the motherboard of a computer or the hard drive. And as the disease is progressing, part of the brain is dying, but the part that's left mm -hmm. it is accurate with the data that was input to the brain at a particular time in their history. And that's the reason your mother might look mm -hmm. at you and you're an adult now, but they're looking for their child that's maybe 10 or six or three because the part of the brain that's working is recalling images from that time that that input went into the brain. So it's a mystery, but, it, but there's also a right. beauty. There's a beauty there because you get to discover the person hidden mm -hmm. inside your loved one that you never knew, but you're going to get to meet them. Right, that's interesting because obviously you're seeing them in many times in their own past when you were unaware. Yes. I also think of it in terms of, you know, sometimes when you're dealing in a situation with a family and you've got uh, someone who's, who's suffering dementia, and you, you, you marvel at people's ability to take care of that person and to do that. But sometimes the part you're missing is you weren't there when they were a little kid that's and true. mom was there and took care of them and the relationship that's really there. And you know, sometimes when uh, people get older, obviously they have their own families and people have disagreements and they can, you know, there's uh, I'm in charge of my house, you're in charge of your house, that's but right. there's still that relationship and there's no stronger relationship than a mother and a child one way or the other because right. a father, it's great, but I never had the child inside of me. The mother always had that and the child came from there and there's some sort of relationship and sometimes we lose sight of uh, the fact that there's all these positive memories of things and they're watching those things slip away. That's true. Well. That's very beautiful too and it's important. It's important to realize all of those things and bring them into the new situation, mm -hmm. you know, and be able to meet the, the loved one with dementia disease, be able to meet them where they are and um, you know, maybe share those right. kinds of memories. And if you are the adult child, you can still enter into dialogue with them to talk about yourself when you were the baby. Mm -hmm. And they might not recognize you looking at you, but their heart knows your heart. The heart doesn't get to mention. Right. The heart has to do with love and God and it's eternal. And those kinds of things right. you're talking about, those are matters of the heart. And at the same time, was your experience as well there are, that there are times, and obviously it tends to go downhill, but where the person like clicks back in yes. for periods of time and yes. then will drift. But at the same time, I always think in terms of when they talk about people in comas and things like that, they hear a lot more. They, they take in a lot more. And I think it's a mistake. And uh, you know, at times I've heard people say, well, that's not my father anymore. That's not my mother anymore. And in one way, yeah, I understand what you're saying because like you said, that relationship, the person you knew, but at its core, that's still a child of God and that's still your mother and that's still your father. It is still and you know, the important thing too, Doug, is that they might not recognize 
what they see in you. Their brain might not let them call the name that you want to hear. But again, the heart knows the heart. And it is important that we never mm -hmm. consider that that's not my mother or my father or my husband. We have to see them um, in their journey backwards. They're becoming little. And I think for the Christian, we, we know that what our Lord told us was that what you do to the least you do to me. Mm -hmm. When we see an adult person becoming little and incompetent through dementia disease. It, it is a call to love in a very deep way. But what I discovered in this mm. journey was that yes, it was a call to love my husband who is becoming little, but it was a call to love with a big L, he who is love. It was a call to see our Lord hidden in the situation, right. to see that in my husband who had become the least, though I still looked at this six foot four man, he was very little on the inside, but hidden in there was right. our Lord. Right. And I think that sense of hope and purpose and knowing that we get from our right. faith helps us, it gives us fuel for the journey. And ultimately you didn't love him for what he could do for you. You loved him for who he was who and who he, he still is. And, and you still see that in, in that person. And, and obviously we hope to see that person again in the next life. So obviously there's a connectedness to this. And that's where I think faith is so important. And here yes. we are in the year of faith. How does this tie in or does it in your mind? Oh, I think it ties in tremendously because I think the journey of Alzheimer's and dementia disease itself is an opportunity to go Duke and Altum, as our Holy Father, Pope John Paul used to say. Um, you know, it's time to go deep and mm -hmm. you have to go deep. The disease calls, calls you to go deep, to see with the eyes of your heart. And so when you do this and when you frame the entire situation in the will of God and you accept that even though it's painful, it's at least his permissive will. And we do seek to love him, to know him, to serve him in the situation that what we're doing is in fact growing closer to our Lord as we grow closer, we're, dis we're in discovery. It's great discovery. The mystery of discovering your loved one um, is leading you to right. discover our Lord in a more intimate way. And it's important, I think, as well, because all of these things are very good and it's all true. At the same time, the person who is the caregiver, who's dealing with this, who loves this person and, and many times is frustrated because they wish they could save them. They can't. Yes. At the same time, no matter what they do, it's not enough. No matter the days go on, it's uh, 35 hour, 48 hour days, literally. Yes. It always seems like it's going on and there's never any payback in effect. There's never the, oh, we've accomplished it. Oh, gee, hon, thanks so much for what you did for me. In fact, it, many times it's the opposite because of the dementia and distortion. So we also have and this book is helpful for those who are going through that part of the equation who need to understand it's okay to be tired. It's okay to feel sorry for yourself and realize yes. that you are going through a lot, that it's, you're not a it's bad normal. person just because you're not perfect all the time, right? And that's part of the reason I shared my story in the book is because I made a lot of mistakes, but I learned from them. And I think that's the important thing is to learn from the mistakes. And then when you get on the other side mm -hmm. of this journey, to be able to go backwards through it and learn what the lesson in life was. What's the lesson for the soul? And then to share it with other people. We all, it, we're writing a story, but we're called to share those mm -hmm. stories to help people that are coming along. And, um, you know, I think th the message of Fatima, I think about where Our Lady at Fatima said, it is important that we offer our suffering mm -hmm. for the souls that don't have anyone to pray for them and that when, Those in purgatory. Yes, right, right? that so many souls go to hell because no one prays for them. And um, I think about the, um, the situation here. It's a very dark, it's very difficult, there's pain. We have this unique opportunity mm -hmm. to unite the suffering, mm -hmm. to really make this a case of sacrificial agape love. And in the spirit of what Our Lady at Fatima is asking for, we unite this. We say, Lord, thy will be done. We give our fiat in the situation and say, Lord, show me what you want me to do. Show me how to love. Show me your grace in the situation. And, um, you know, J Pope John Paul had this great devotion to Our Lady of Fatima. And then, mm -hmm. and I went there last year and, and learned that Pope Benedict had just been there mm -hmm. in 2010 and talked about how that message of embracing suffering and penance mm -hmm. um, was so important now 
than even in 1917. So, you know, for Catholics especially who um, see what's happening in the world today, um, this year of faith, this this renewed call to our intimacy with Jesus, right. Our Lady's call to see um, the purpose and the meaning and suffering and to unite it and right. offer it for souls. It's, it's a great time. Now you wrote this book, I'm assuming you weren't intending to kind of in a sense start an apostolate or a ministry, you're doing radio, you're out speaking, obviously you've written all these things. Let me ask you, we're, 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 we're in 2013, uh, some would say the culture of death won in some ways with the election, at least from a political perspective. That's not the ultimate victory, of course. We know where that lies. But this fits into, too, because this whole idea of if we don't prize life at the beginning of life, are we going to prize it at the end of life? It's getting very utilitarian. The whole medical system is going to lend itself. Clearly, it's going to lend itself to people making decisions basically on who should get care and who shouldn't get care. That's true. Dementia lends itself into people saying, you know, you know, they go from being terminally ill that somebody's going to die to somebody who has dementia who, yeah, might die over a period of time, but certainly isn't terminally ill in the sense that they're, they're, it's going to come quickly. Do you see or are you afraid in some ways in dealing with this that we'll see people start to say, well, you know, she's kind of gone anyway. She's dead to me anyway. Dad's dead to me anyway. It's just draining the resources. We can't afford this. It's uh, it's it's a lot of work. Uh, maybe he'd be better off if he just we just ended it now. You see that euthanasia aspect. Well, here. I do, and I already see in Europe that there has been a tendency to euthanize those who have dementia disease. Mm -hmm. You know, the focus seems to be on first of all, it's it's excessive cost, mm -hmm. and they look at the quality of life, and they're making decisions mm -hmm. that are based on, you know, not God and what we know about the. Uh, the, the purpose of mm -hmm. suffering. And so often, letting someone who's suffering live through that period is kind of a working out of their own purgatory here on earth. Mm -hmm. But also, it has purgatorial benefits for those that are caring for them. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's moving from the east to the West, we've already seen in the United States, you know, votes come up for um, assisted suicide being legal. Uh, we don't know where any of that's going, but we see the mentality mm -hmm. that says if it costs money or it's difficult, and then people not seeing what is there. Dementia tends to um, lead you to either look at what's gone or to see what's still there. And we need to recognize both. So it's both. a glass half full of a It is, it's half full. Yeah. But there are beautiful mm -hmm. mysteries and gifts that come out through people in full-blown dementia disease. There's a neurologist, a Dr. Potts, who has, he, he does a lot of teaching around the world about how his father with dementia disease became a full-blown watercolor artist in the midst of advanced dementia disease. He never was an artist. His art now is shown all over the world and it is incredibly impressive. And so, you know, as we see people go backwards, when they get to the stage in the brain where they're about maybe six years old or younger, there's this burst of creative mm -hmm. ability, just mm -hmm. as there is with young people that are toddlers. And you can connect with them. With, they love cookies, they love anything that has to do with um, Christmas and singing, they can pray, even mm -hmm. though they can't. In lucid moments, they may be able to still talk to you mm -hmm. in the present moment and be firing you know, with all their spark plugs. But most of the time, you're going to be able to deal with them in more of a childlike time. And you just think back about all the things that young people like. And that's what we need to focus on. What is there? Yeah. What's the beauty of what's there? And what is God's timing with this person's life? Well, let me ask you, yeah, the, uh, the last thing that you've put out now has been the audio recording. Let me ask you, what was it like to reread the book effectively and to record it? It was very difficult for me. And I'll tell you, we were uh, editing the book around the time of um, my husband's death. It was my husband died around the time of his birthday and at Christmas, it was between it Thanksgiving. All came together. It all came together. Mm -hmm. And there were moments in the recording that I broke down. But, you know, the, um, the, re the recording artist said, we need to keep this just as it is mm -hmm. because it is, it is your raw emotion of the journey and people who, who hear this right. get an, a deeper appreciation for what you went through. And so uh, there was another interesting part in there uh, when I was reading um, a poem that was called One Dark Lenten Night 
very deep and it started thundering outside and even though we were in a soundproof some of the thunder came through really? I okay. said I said leave it mm -hmm. if the Lord let that thunder come through leave it mm -hmm. and okay. so that was that was pretty exciting okay just to ask you we're just about out of time what's next well I continued to work you know this this journey of discovering my husband uh, the little Frank hidden in the big Frank mm -hmm. discovering our Lord hidden in my husband who was the least uh, ultimately led me into a much, much deeper journey with our Lord, led me really into a relationship with Him uh, when, when our Lord was in the womb. And so, you know, all of that has been sort of developing in mm -hmm. my apostolate uh, of dementia. I have to just see where the Lord takes okay, me. Right. Um, a lot of great plans, so I tell folks just to okay. stay tuned and, uh, but to embrace it. It's a call of love. He'll give us the grace that we need because it is a call to love. It's a call to ultimately to love Him. Well, thank you so much for, for loving your husband so much uh, to share him with us. Thank you. Uh, and help others out there. Ellen Marie Edmonds, Embracing Dementia, A Call to Love. There's the book. We also have the uh, large edition, and since large print edition available through the E.W. Tim Religious Catalog. And the latest is actually the audio recording with Ellen Marie Edmonds reading it herself. Check it out through EW10's Religious Catalog. Join us next time right here on EW10's Book One.